Hello, and thank you for joining us today as we mark Yom HaShoah. My name is Karen Pollock, and I'm the Chief Executive of the Holocaust Educational Trust. We're a charity, and our mission is clear. We want to teach everyone, everywhere, about the Holocaust. We want people to know what happened for the sake of those that were murdered, to honor those that survived, and so that we can learn the lessons for today. We work with schools and colleges across the country. We ensure that teachers are trained and have the resources to use in the classroom. We arrange for Holocaust survivors to share their testimony. And we work with young people, creating a generation of HET ambassadors who know where hatred and anti-Semitism can lead and are determined to stop it in its tracks. This time last year, I was deeply honored to be joined by the late Rabbi Lord Sachs. He, we took part in the first online Yom HaShoah event. It was a special opportunity for us all to hear his wisdom and to learn. Rabbi Lord Sachs was a great advocate for the Holocaust Educational Trust. He loved our survivors and was very much loved by them. He is truly missed. Today, as we mark Yom HaShoah, and we pay tribute to the memory of the six million men, women, and children murdered in the Holocaust. We also honor those who survived, and I know many of whom are tuned in today. They're an inspiration who even today are sharing their testimony via Zooms and Teams, ensuring that the memory is kept alive. And the bravery of the survivors who've shared their experiences, they are the people who've helped the world understand the truth of the Holocaust, the truth of the past. And the truth of the past is that the Holocaust was perpetrated by human beings, not monsters. There is one man whose life, life's mission has been to ensure that those people who committed those unimaginable crimes are brought to justice, even now, 76 years after the end of the Second World War. I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Chief Nazi Hunter Ephraim Zuroff, the director of the Simon Wiesenthal Center's Israel office. Ephraim, welcome. Thank you very much, Karen. And Ephraim, before I go into a whole series of questions for you, how are you? And tell us how things are over there, because I know you're in Israel and you're aware that we are, whilst restrictions are easing over here, we are still um, living in certain uh, confinements. Well, we're doing fairly well and we're emerging, I think, from the worst of the pandemic. And thanks to the efforts of the government, more than half the population has been vaccinated. So things are looking optimistic for a change. That's good to hear. And I'm assuming that includes you, Ephraim. Yes, it does, of course. Fantastic. Well, Ephraim, there's a lot to catch up on, and no doubt you'll bring things into all these questions, but I'm hoping that in this series of questions, our audience can get a bit of an understanding about what you do and even the challenges that you're facing today. However many years afterwards, there are still so much information and research and truth that is unraveling. But let's start with my first question. Today, as you know, we're here together because we're marking Yom HaShoah. And as we remember the victims of the Holocaust, what role do you think discussions about justice play, particularly, particularly on a day like today? There's no question that the efforts to bring those responsible for the crimes of the Holocaust to justice are a very important component of how we relate to the Holocaust. And in a sense, it's a unique subject because of its implications, because of its difficulties, and the various obstacles that we face in trying to bring these people to justice. So, but I think having said that, those efforts when successful do afford a measure of comfort to the survivors, to their families, and some element of closure. And I wanna tell you that uh, Simon Wiesenthal, who was probably the most important Nazi hunter, and our mentor always emphasized that aspect of it to fulfill our obligation as the generation after to do whatever we could to bring as many of those people to justice and thereby 
also afford a measure of closure for their relatives and friends. And why do you think it's so important today, so 76 years after the camps were liberated, to continue even today to seek that justice and to bring perpetrators um, to the courts? How many Nazis even, you know, who evaded justice at the time, do you think are still living and still living their lives free from prosecution? First of all, I have to say that because of the extension of life expectancy, we're having this discussion. In other words, if 80 years after the Operation Barbarossa had been in 1920, I don't think there'd be anybody left. But here we are in 2021, and in June we're marking the implementation, the beginning of the implementation of the, of the final solution, and there still are such people. So just recently, Germany has uh, submitted indictments, have filed indictments against two people, one of whom was the secretary of the Commandant of Stutthof, uh, Hopper, uh, and another one was a guard for more than three years in Sachsenhausen. And we're busy now trying to look for survivors, for example, of Sachsenhausen, um, and people who could serve as co-plaintiffs who lost a, a first-degree relative in that camp. So the work goes on, and um, as long as it's possible, we'll continue to do it because of the importance judicially, morally, and also in a time of increased anti-Semitism and the problems that we face in, in terms of Holocaust denial and distortion, these trials remain an important tool, a very important tool, I would even say, in preserving the accuracy of the narrative. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll tell you one interesting thing, you know, Germany admitted a million and a half refugees from countries with deep traditions of anti-Semitism. So imagine what's going through the minds of these refugees, and especially their children and grandchildren, when they see that Germany brings an elderly person to trial for crimes of the Holocaust. What they were taught was that the Holocaust never happened. So the lesson in terms of the history of the Shoah, in terms of the fight against anti-Semitism, the rule of law, and all of that. So I don't think we can convince the elderly generation of any of this, of course, but it's their children and grandchildren who will apparently continue to live in, in civilized Europe. And it's obviously very important. So this is, this is also an unexpected byproduct of these trials. And what about um, going a bit more particular? You talked before about, for example, somebody who was um, the secretary, a secretary at Stutthof. When we talk about the measure of the crime, somebody who was a commandant or somebody who was responsible for uh, murder and those who are administrators, in your eyes, or how do you present the difference between these sorts of perpetrators and their complicity and therefore what justice um, is required? First of all, I have to explain to you that in 1943, the Nazis built a gas chamber in Stutthof and they began using it as part of the implementation of the final solution. This woman, Ermagard Fruchner, uh, had all of these activities pass through her, her, her desk, and she was, her office was a few meters away from the gas chamber, if I'm not mistaken. So she saw everything, and everything passed through her. And there's no reason to ignore her because she's a woman, or because she's 95, or, or whatever. So the passage of time in no way diminishes the guilt of the killers. Old age should not afford protection for such people. We owe it to the victims to try and bring as many of the people as possible responsible for turning innocent people into victims because they were classified as enemies to the Reich. So there are many, many good reasons why this is so important. And I'll just add one thing, which I think is, is important. In all the 40 years that I've been involved in this, I've never met, I've been actively involved in a case in which any of these perpetrators ever expressed any remorse or regret. That's one thing. And the second thing is, contrary to what most people think, people did have a choice. There's no documented case of a single Nazi ever being executed for refusing to kill Jews. So if you, for example, read a book like Christopher Browning's Ordinary Men, 
You see, specifically, before they started the shooting, they said to him, if there's anyone who doesn't want to do this, who feels that they can't do this, please let us know, and you'll simply be transferred to something else, that's all. And this, of yeah. course, makes all the crimes much worse, as you can imagine. It's, it's one of those um, myths, if you like, we have to constantly dispel when we're talking about the Holocaust, that people somehow presume that every perpetrator had a gun to their head right. and was told, if you don't do this, you're going to die. Well, that's actually not the case. And it's something that we've discovered, um, you know, we have to emphasize in teacher training and teaching practice, but also just generally dispelling that myth. And just to say about Stutthof, I, I know that you're aware of this already, Ephraim, but there are two British Holocaust survivors from Stutthof, Ziggy Schipper and Manfred Goldberg, who Goldberg, no doubt are right, watching yeah. this. And you'll remember that they took uh, um, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, they facilitated a visit for them so that they could see the site for themselves. And they themselves are witnesses and no doubt have um, strong views about those who were complicit in the crimes that took place there. I'm going to go on just to ask you a question. Um, before we come to the UK, what would you say, I mean, it's a strange question because any case that, is, that succeeds is a success. But is there one that you feel particularly proud of or you feel was really significant that you were involved in? That's the first question A, if you like. And then part B, how many cases have you investigated or that you're aware of where the perpetrator doesn't end up facing justice? Is there a number or, and, and the why, why or why not? Okay, so the case, the most important case um, in which I was able to facilitate the extradition, prosecution, and of a, of a leading Nazi war criminal who was convicted and punished was the case of the commander of the Asenovats concentration camp in Croatia. One of the worst camps, the worst camp in the Balkans, a camp that was nicknamed the Auschwitz of the Balkans, a camp in which approximately 100,000 people were murdered, mostly Serbs, but also many Jews, many gypsies and Croatian anti-fascists. And this is the case of Dinko Shakic, whom we exposed in Argentina. And he was put on trial in a very dramatic trial, a trial which had in the short run, had a very significant effect on Croatian society and exposed the crimes of the Ustasha, that's the Croatian fascists, to the Croatian public uh, in a very meaningful way. So that, I think, is the, you know, just to give you a little example of what we were up against in Croatia, because we had a very big dilemma where he should be sent. In other words, if we were thinking only result, we probably would have preferred to send him to Serbia because most of the victims were Serbs. Uh, and as I say, half facetiously in Belgrade. But the question we asked ourselves was who needs the lesson of Croatia, of, of, of the Yesenovats the most? So in Serbia, everyone knows about Yesenovats. So we didn't, they didn't need the lesson. But in Croatia, a country where there was quite a bit of nostalgia for the Ustasha, and many people thought that Chakic was a hero, this was particularly important. So I want to tell you an interesting story. In 1998, Chakic had been extradited from Argentina. And that summer, the Mundial, the World Cup, was being played in France. And on July 4th, 1998, there was a quarterfinals match between Croatia and Germany, who was the favorite to win the World Cup. Then Croatia is a country of uh, about 5 million people, and Germany is a real powerhouse. And uh, it was an amazing, what happened was actually quite amazing. Croatia won 3 0 in the, big, the biggest upset in World Cup history. But when I went out of the hotel after I saw the match, and I, I wanted to see the celebrations, within three or four minutes, I see a group of seven young men marching towards me waving this gigantic flag, which I was, it wasn't clear if it was an Ustasha flag or a Croatian flag, because they're quite similar. And they're yelling at the top of their lungs, Dinko Shakic, Dinko Shakic. And Dinko Shakic is in jail. He's awaiting trial for mass murder. He didn't score the goals for Croatia 
against against Germany, right? Why are they yelling his name? Because he's a hero. Because he knew how to deal with Croatia's enemies, the Serbs, the Jews, the Gypsies, the leftists. And that's what we were up against. And I have to give the Croatians credit. They did a good job in the trial. The judge, Drazen Tripolo, did a fantastic job, I have to say. And he was sentenced, and he was uh, sentenced to the maximum sentence, and he died in prison. The sad, the sad postscript, though, in, in this case, however, is that at his funeral, it was a private funeral, he asked to be buried in his Ustasha uniform, and the priest said the following, and listen very carefully, he said, it's true that Dinko Shatich did not observe all the Ten Commandments, and if you allow me to interject, like thou shalt not murder, okay? <laughs> Nonetheless, he's a symbol for Croatia. And so they so, allowed it. If this is the religious leadership, you could imagine what a problem we have with the Stasha nostalgia. And how long would it take for, from the moment he's extradited to the fact that he then gets sentenced? Like how, over what period of time? It took about a year. It took about a year. He disappeared when, once he was exposed, but th that didn't last very long. And then there was the extradition process, then the preparation of the trial, it was at least a year. And in answer to the other question, which is quite a difficult one, because it's, you know, have there been cases or how many cases have you investigated where the perpetrator doesn't end up facing justice? And I imagine there's more Far than one. Far too many. Far yeah. too many. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very uphill battle and it's a very frustrating battle. We have cases in which the suspect died in, during the investigation. I had a, a case of the police chief, Hungarian police chief, of Hungarian occupied uh, Kosice uh, in Slovakia, who sent more than 15,000 Jews uh, to Auschwitz, deported them to Auschwitz. And we, he had run away to Canada. He was actually tried in absentia in Czechoslovakia and sentenced to death, but he had run away. He was in Canada. The Canadians stripped him of his citizenship. He disappeared. We found him through our project, Operation Last Chance, in which we offer financial rewards for, for information. And we finally, finally convinced the Hungarians to put him on trial, and he died a week before the trial. I'm telling you, I, <laughs> this is one really frustrating job. Yeah. It's, it's, um, there's something about that, which is you are dealing with people who are in their older years, but the fact that you get to the point where, you know, you're just on the brink of being able to expose in a, in a court of law, you know, in a formal way that people respect, um, you know, what this person is responsible for, to have that thwarted because of time. Um, I, I have to tell you, tell you a fascinating story about this case. I had very, uh, very important help from Brian Flynn, who was a reporter for The Sun, and I'll explain to you what happened. Brian was always willing to help me any case I needed his help, he was there. And he sent photographers to, to Budapest. And at one point we lost track of him, we couldn't find him. And then we got a tip and we found out where he was. In any event, uh, they knocked on his door and he answered the door in his underwear. And his photograph in his underwear was on the front page of the sun on a Sunday. Yeah. Within three days he was charged in Hungary. In other words, I say to myself, how do you get a Nazi indicted? You photograph him in his underwear. <laughs> um, let me ask you a bit more specifically about the UK and um, the handling of the issue of Nazi war criminals. You and I both know the War Crimes Bill was passed in 1991 here. Um, it enables us to prosecute Nazi war criminals. Um, and it was thanks very much to a huge amount of work from the all-party war crimes group, whose uh, leadership was also the Holocaust Educational Trust founders, and we were established as a direct result of that campaign. But we know that, I mean, I can think of two cases and only one successful one um, in this country. Um, there was a recent BBC Radio 4 documentary, which you're aware of. It's called The Nazi Next Door, and it was only aired, I think, two, maybe three weeks ago. And 
it reminds people that there were Nazis who found sanctuary here in the UK. And the documentary makes claims that as well as I think what is widely known that there were Nazis who came to this country, that evidence was destroyed by the British intelligence services to ensure that war criminals evaded justice. What are your thoughts on this and on the UK's record on this issue? I think it is worth Ephraim talking a bit about the past because you were involved too. So about, you know, or, or, you know the history of, of the UK sort of um, dealing with war crim Nazi war criminals, but specifically as well, this um, what seems to be news, um, a new angle. Well, I don't know if you read yesterday's New York Times, but there was just a revelation that one of the key Gestapo officers in Vienna, Franz Josef Huber, was hired by the CIA or the predecessor of the CIA, the OSS. So this, this was common and it was far more widespread than people, than people understand. And, and I have to say, and I, I said this to Nick Southall of BBC, this was a double betrayal. In other words, the Allies didn't stop Hitler when they could have stopped him. And as a result, he victimized millions of people, millions, six million Jews. And then the Allies, for whatever reason, I mean, they, obviously reasons of state, state interest, they gave some of these people a free ride, brought them to the UK, brought them to the United States, or to some other countries, and made sure that they would not be prosecuted. And, you know, this is so disgusting, you'll excuse me, really. It's, it's an insult. It's, a, it's an insult to, to, to the victims of the Holocaust and to our families and to all of us. But that's the truth. And, and the, sooner, the sooner the scope of it is revealed, the better. And uh, I'm one of the people who called for an investigation as did the head of the Board of Deputies. As did we. Right, and did you. So, you know, the, it's, it's really, really something that should never have been done. And it's good that it's been exposed. And um, maybe people will learn a lesson. Maybe. I, I can't be sure of that. It's a difficult, um, you know, the, the way that we talk about the Allies and Britain and its relationship um, to the Second World War is one of defeating the Nazis, providing a safe haven to kin the kinder transport, um, and so much more. Um, but this is something that does cast a shadow. Um, but the history is a complex one, isn't it? And as you say, the sooner we find out, the better. Listen, you know, I'll give you another example. Uh, the, one of the biggest cases, that in, in, certain, in a certain sense, one of the cases that convinced Sir Thomas uh, Hetherington and William Chalmers, who were the um, the pair that did this special investigation for the British Parliament you know, and convinced them basically that Britain could not walk away from this um, was the Gekas case in Edinburgh. Montanus Gekas, or Getsevich, his name was originally. He was the commander of a Lithuanian murder squad, the 12th Battalion, that was sent in October 6, 1941, to Belarus to murder Jews there. Um, he was on my list. I, I'm the person who made the first list of Nazi war criminals living in the UK, and which was submitted to the British authorities and created the whole issue. And he was living in Edinburgh, and it later turned out that he too had been wor working for MI5 as, as a spy in the, in the coal board. So, and he also was never brought to justice. By yeah. the time the Lithuanians asked for his extradition, it was too late and he died. The irony of his story was that he, he died and he was buried under a different name because his family was afraid that Jews would come to protest at the funeral. They didn't realize that he was buried on Rosh Hashanah, so the number of Jews who would have come was probably <laughs> very was small. Turn up. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, it's almost poetic justice. His victims are lying in mass graves in Belarus. There's no names on the grave, trust me. I've been to Belarus and I went with uh, Ruta Vanagaita 
in, I wrote about it in my last book, Our People, Discovering Lithuania's Hidden Holocaust. There are no names there. It's just a mass of, of corpses. And he also, again, a, a sort of poetic justice, he was buried under a false name. Let me ask you a, a slightly different question. Um, the Nazi next door is examining history and raising issues um, that need investigation. But there are more recently, I would say over recent years, there are, um, you know, there's for example, the devil next door on Netflix. There's the drama on prime called hunters. It's fiction. Um, do you think there's a bit of a fascination or obsession about Nazi war criminals? Um, what do you think about it all? Like when you see this stuff, what, what, what do you think? Okay, first of all, it depends whether what's being shown is accurate or not. The Amazon series, The Hunters, was pure bull, you'll excuse me. I mean, mm. absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. With little or no connection to reality. Uh, the, the ideas about a Fourth Reich, and the only thing true was that there was Operation Paperclip and scientists were brought to, to the United States. As far as, um, you know, factual documentaries, they're actually quite important. And uh, they can serve as a very important educational tool. But again, sometimes you don't know. I mean, listen, there was just a movie, there would have been movies in, in Croatia, for example, trying to claim that Yesenovac was, was a labor camp and only after the end of World War II did the communists turn it into, into a camp with multiple executions. I mean, this is crazy, absolutely mad. So we find ourselves fighting for the narrative at a time when we never imagined that we would have to do that. In other words, Holocaust denial is one thing, but the good news is that Holocaust denial has more or less been defeated thanks to the Irving trial. So there's no one in the West, no mainstream social or political organization that's disseminating Holocaust denial. But in Eastern Europe, we're up against terrible lies in all the countries of post-communist Eastern Europe because they can't handle the fact that in Eastern Europe, in many countries, collaboration with the Nazis included participation in systematic mass murder by the collaborators. Yeah. And they're trying to hide it, of course. And, some, and the other thing is that some of the people who are their heroes, whom they're glorifying because they fought against the Soviets after World War II, are people who murdered their Jewish neighbors. So you would imagine that if someone murdered his Jewish neighbors, that would disqualify them from being national heroes, but not in Lithuania or in Latvia or in any of these places. And, and just going on from that question, because it was where I wanted to go to anyway, with regards to exactly your point that Holocaust denial, perhaps less so, but distortion and revisionism is still, you know, um, alive and well. In terms of how you, I don't know, how, how do you shape or, or help um, uphold the correct narrative? Um, bearing in mind, yes, it is about the truth and it's about, yes, useful documentaries are ways to point to the truth, but how do we battle with what seems to be an ongoing issue? And as you say, specifically in, in certain countries, this sort of question of complicity or by doing something good afterwards it somehow negates what you've done during the second world war okay there are basically four goals to the people in other words those who are behind this effort to distort the narrative and produce a false narrative one is to minimize or hide the role played by local nazi collaborators in the murders two is to try and convince the first europe and then the world that communist crimes were just as bad or even worse than Nazi crimes, and that communist crimes are genocide. Now, that's particularly important because there were Jews who worked in the KGB or the NKVD who committed these crimes against the peoples of Eastern Europe. So in other words, if, if communist crimes are genocide, that means that Jews committed genocide. If Jews committed genocide, then how can we complain about what they did? In other words, if everybody is guilty, no one's guilty. Then there's the whole issue of the glorification heroes, which I explained. And the fourth issue is the attempts to get uh, first Europe and then the world to observe a joint Memorial Day for all the victims of totalitarian regimes. Now, that would be a death blow to International Holocaust Day. 
because you wouldn't need it. You yeah. have a day more inclusive, more victims. You know, I mean, there's a limit to how many days you can have. So th th these are the goals. I mean, they're manifest in what's called the Prague Declaration of June 3rd, 2008. And the way to fight against it is obviously to try and present the truth and bring the truth to the public in a way that the public will understand it. So just to give you an example, I teamed up with a Lithuanian author, a very popular Lithuanian author named Ruta Vanagaita. And she discovered that her relatives, her, her grandfather and her aunt's husband, were involved in persecution and murder of Jews during the Shoah. And she wanted to atone for it. And what we ultimately decided to do was to go on a mission to 40 places, 35 in Lithuania and five in Belarus, where this Lithuanian unit was sent, um, and to go to see, can we find the places? Is there a monument? We uh, interviewed eyewitnesses, all non-Jews, people who saw it with their own eyes, people who lived right next to the mass grave. We went to local museums to, to see what's there about the Jewish community. So I, I just want to tell you briefly two stories that will illustrate what, what we encountered. So we were in a small town called Trencionelli, which is not far from where, by the way, in our itinerary, we made up based on our biographies, because my, my mother's family, my maternal grandparents were both born in Lithuania, but they left, they left well before the war. In any event, so we went to a small town called Svencionelli, near where my grandfather was born. And uh, I saw an elderly woman coming out of a grocery store. So I said to Ruta, I don't speak Lithuanian. So I said to Ruta, listen, Ruta, go over there, ask her what's, if she remembers anything. She looked the right age. Okay, so she, she told us the following story. Her family was friendly with the Jewish family in the town. And when all the decrees started against the Jews, and ah, in each family had two children, two girls, and she was the same age as the younger daughter. She was the younger daughter in her family, and she was the same age as the younger daughter in the other family. And when the decrees against the Jews began, there was an intense discussion in her family whether or not they could save her friend. So I said to her, through Ruta, I said to her, listen, you, you probably were afraid of the Germans. She said, no, we could have hidden her forever. We were afraid of our neighbors. And she started crying. I tell you, it was like so, so touching in a certain way. I, I had the feeling um, that this is the first time she ever told the story to anyone who could sympathize with her. And it was like an enormous rock bowled the rolled off her heart that she could finally tell it to someone who would understand why she was so upset. In Panovich, Panaves in Lithuania, the site of the famous yeshiva, 7,000 Jews lived there before the show. I went to the local museum. So we met, the, at the entrance we saw the person in charge of the media relations. And I asked him, I said, is there anything here about the Jewish community? He says, no. So I said to him, Do, are you aware of the fact that millions of people all over the world know the name of your town? He goes, what? What are you talking about? Why would they know the name of our town? I said, you know the bakery, conditory opposite the bus station? That's the building of the Panovich Yeshiva. And I explained to him what a yeshiva was, what's a rabbi, what, you know, all, all the facts that he needed to know. The guy was in total shock. And I said to Ruta, when, I, when we walked out of there, I said to her, you know, there's a famous story in the book of Kings about King Ahab of Israel. There was a fellow named Navot who had a beautiful vineyard right next to his palace. And Ahab wanted to, wanted to take over the vineyard. So he offered to buy the vineyard from Navot. Navot refused. So Ahab killed him and he took over the vineyard. And not long after that, Elijah the prophet encountered Ahab, and he said to him, Haratzachta v'gam yarashta, you murdered and you inherited? And it's become a classic term in a sense. I said to Ruta, Ratzachta yarashta machakta, you murdered the Jews, 
you inherited all their property and belongings, and then you erased them. They don't exist anymore. In this town where there were 7,000 Jews. And that's the story, and that's part of the story. And the book created an enormous scandal. Uh -huh. The only reason it was published was because Ruta had written books for the biggest and most popular publisher in Lithuania. And they wanted to keep her writing for them. So they said that she, she had written a bestseller. It sold 50,000 copies in a country of less than two and a half million people. Uh -huh. It's about women at 50. It's like pop psychology. So they said, we went to see them and we we're going to tell them what we're doing. So, so they said to listen, Ruta, you wrote such a beautiful book about women. Why don't you write a book about men? So I, she said, oh, I'll, I'll write a book about men. But first you're going to write the book I'm writing now. You're going to publish the book I'm writing now. Ah, Ruta, wonderful. What are you writing about? The Holocaust. Gott in Himmel, what on earth are you doing? You crazy? No one's going to read this book. She said, if you want me to continue writing for you, you have to publish it. So he said, okay, on one condition, you don't tell anybody what you're writing about until the book comes out. And that's what she did. So they published, they printed 2,000 copies, sold out and less. And the readers were, I think, the older generation who lived through the war and the young people who grew up in the EU. And it made an enormous scandal. And they later took it out on Ruta and they turned her into persona non grata when she criticized one of these Lithuanian heroes. They took all her books out of the bookstores. In other words, only one of her books was about to show out. That's the one she wrote with me. All the others had nothing to do with it. 27,000 copies. She just launched her autobiography. The next day, this whole thing broke and all the books were taken out and she had to run away because, the, for example, the father of Lithuanian independence, Landsbergis wrote, now that you've betrayed the country, why don't you go commit suicide? Not oh in those goodness. words, but that's what he meant. Yeah, okay. It's unbelievable. So she spent three years in Jerusalem. <laughs> but it, it shows the, you know, Perhaps you, I, whilst it's shocking, it's still perhaps shocking yet unsurprising, right? But for a lot of people, they, it's not clear that these repercussions still exist today, that having that sort of, you know, open conversation about the truth should lead to such, um, you know, such extremities. Um, Listen. We're seeing this all over Eastern Europe. But I have to say one thing that I think is critical. From my experience, and we've been at this quite, for many years, we're, we're fighting this battle. The only way to win is this with local help. You can't do it from the outside. And, and one of the places that I learned that is in the UK, when we, when we launched a campaign to convince the British government to pass a law to prosecute Nazis. Without the all party war crimes group, it never would have happened. And the help that they gave us was invaluable and they played the major role and it was fantastic cooperation. And that's how we won the battle. So speaking to the head of the HGT, which <laughs> is the byproduct of the all party war crimes group is a special privilege for me. So I wish you strength, perseverance and a long life. Thank you, Ephraim. You know, I've witnessed the impact you have uh, in the classroom with lots of our young people and with our teachers. They are absolutely fascinated by what you have to say. And I know they will be from this session too. The thing about conversation with the UF and some curiosity, it makes us want to find out more um, and do more. And I think if there's ever, um, you know, something to be proud of, it's that fact that people have this, as a result of hearing from you, more of a thirst for knowledge and more of a determination to do the right thing. And I think you set such a great example for all of us. So really, it's just my job to say thank you to you, Ephraim Zora, for joining us, but also to everybody who's tuned in, to Mark Yom HaShoah, and to remember, thank you for taking time to consider the legacy and the impact of the Holocaust.
And I wish you all good luck and success and be there to fight against intolerance, racism, xenophobia, and all the like. Thank you, Ephraim, and best of luck and take care. We'll see you soon.